Spitfires and Cardinals. Now, my wife has dictated that today is officially designated Let's Put the Tile in the Fireplace Day. So spend a few minutes with us and see why, why my Spitfire isn't finished yet. Oh, St. Nick can come down our fake fireplace chimney into our fake bedroom. <sighs> I, I should be spending more time modeling and less time on this fireplace. Anyway. It's the truth, too. I'm not kidding. It's true. It's true. It's true. Life is more than just spitfires, but, well, spitfires and fireplaces. I was wrong. It's spitfires, fireplaces, and fish. Now, you see these fish in the pond? These are the Burt and Ernie's. I got another Burt and Ernie Christmas card today. It's after Christmas, and I'm getting Burt and Ernie from all over the country. Glenn Keller thinks I don't know he's doing this. Anyway, look how small the fish are, and look how big they are. Oh, God, when you go out in a pond, they're two feet long now. They're like monsters. Hey, but then well, I'm like a monster, too. Now, if you've seen the, the videos before this, saw how I restored this piece of cast iron, made this, I don't know what you call it, surround, but it's the day to do the tile work. By the way, this is quarter inch balsa wood here. Who else do you have? <laughs> balsa wood fireplace. Oh, God. You ready to go to work, Karen? Look at these tiles. Now these tiles match our bed sheets. What is it they match, Karen? The bed sheets? Mm -hmm. They match something. Ah, and we have these coordinating accent stripe tiles. And we have several choices as how we're going to lay these out and put them in there. We originally thought we were going to lay these out. And you can see how it, it follows that pattern. It's the same pattern. These are Laura Ashley tiles. But unfortunately, when you go to bring it down here, it's the thickness of the tile. It doesn't marry up here well. I don't know what I can do to disguise that edge, if anything. I have to think about what I'm going to do about that now. One of the things you don't anticipate is those, those edge tiles are thicker than these tiles. And this one fits right in there, in fact. The first step of any tile work like this is figuring out what the pattern's actually going to be and cutting up some of the pieces. And this, this is where you need Karen. Now, before I start cutting tiles, I, I know for sure the green, the dark green, is going to go along the border, so I can set that up. This is where we spend three quarters of our life watching the home shows. How many home shows a week do we watch, Care? Two. Two? Two hundred? No. We never get to watch railroads and trains. Your channel, sir, but we catch two minutes of them. No, 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 no. Look, more home shows. One of the best tricks George ever showed me was buttering both sides of the tile and the wood. Let it kind of dry up a little bit, get sticky. Before I start laying these out. And boy, you want to see a master of tile. This whole bathroom was done by the master. Even the shower. A lot of tiles in there. 4,400 tiles in there. Another George trick. Working from the top down. Because I want to have all of these joints as nice as possible. And if I have to put an odd joint, let it be in the bottom. And while this is drying up, just so I can move on with the next part of the job, I just have some duct tape holding these up while the glue starts to set up. There is some nice piece of steel here. Really nice. And that real that is a real antique. Now with the top piece and we have a choice here. We can just knock the corner out or we can run a grout line here, a grout line here, but we'll still have this little corner. Or we can do a very labor intensive thing of putting a round corner in the tile with a little diamond blade saw. 
and I think that's going to be well worth it. Now this is not exactly in the middle, so I can't use this for three other patterns. Problem is this door is offset because there was a hinge on one side. So we're taking into account the thickness of the hinge, so all four of these are going to have to be figured out separately. So what I did, of course, is made a little paper template pattern, used the paper to get the corner, and then my little diamond handsaw just takes, uh, hey, it took about 10 minutes to make this guy. It takes longer than you think, and then I can even up all my grout lines. Now the centerpiece is just one that's cut, just an ordinary cut. And then I have to reverse this, trace out my pattern for that joint. Not a whole lot different than masking off Brodak Cardinal. <laughs> ah, two down and 12 to go. <laughs> Kind of messy here. I hope I don't get any of this stuff on a rug. <coughs> Just so easy to cut this. It only takes about a half hour to cut. Time for a break. Anyway, the rest of it, the one thing we're getting a break on, the bottom pieces come to a point instead of a curve, so we are saving some on that. Well, some anyway. Not that, the, not that we're looking for the uh, labor of love here or anything. Mm, obviously, next step, this has to dry overnight, and we'll grout it up. Yeah, a lot of the a lot of the little skills that you use in modeling, you can use in this kind of thing too. Assuming that you want to do it, definitely is a lot cheaper than uh, if we had somebody install something like this. Yeah, it's, it's ridiculous. When you do this yourself and you only pay for the material, relatively cheap. Okay, see you tomorrow. Hey, you know, just like you mark your spare paint. Hey, always a good idea to mark the spare tiles. And never do a tile job without having extra tiles. Oh, especially you can see how many I cut that didn't fit. <laughs> cut about nine that didn't fit. But that's about par for the course, especially when you're like me and you're a beginner. See, I just love the idea that a lot of the skills that you use, you're developing models, building models, whatever. A lot of these skills, they're not only for modeling. You can turn the same skill of block sanding into doing sheetrock work. You can turn the same thing of cutting ribs into laying tile or whatever. And I think that that's just one of the great parts of modeling, is once you develop some of these skills, you really can put them to use in some real-world applications. It's not just building planes. It's the same skills. Now today all I want to do is get the tape off. These dried up nice and solid. Love that sound. Get the grout, I'll mask it all off. Get the grout put in, polish it, and we'll be done with that. Looks like it's going to turn out real nice. Okay, now the reason, this is an old George trick, the reason I like the duct tape, the grout doesn't really stick to it as, as vigorously as if you use masking tape. And by having everything outlined now, I can use actually one of those little SIG trowels to uh, apply the grout. I'll tell you, this is, this is the part of the job that gets to be messy. And you see what I've done is I've taped the sheet right to the bottom. That's a good trick if you're going to do grout in a room that's finished. Just a couple little tricks. It's almost like modeling, like back masking. Now, if you never used grout before, one of the tricks is mix it as thick as you can. Again, this is just like a modeling skill, like mixing air epoxy. Let it sit about 10 minutes, remix it, and then use that little trowel, or you can use a big float, doesn't matter, and just jam it in between all the cracks on a 45 degree angle. And I have a couple of towels here I'll polish it with, the final uh, little polish. 
and we'll be finished here in a, maybe an hour or so. Now it's always a good idea to give this 15-20 minutes to just dry up and then I'll take and dress all the edges off with a towel and just by constantly polishing and pushing the grout in as far as it'll go and that's going to have to dry overnight before I can take the tape off and then dress off the edge with a razor blade. Hey, if you never did this, there's nothing a whole lot different than this than, than this, the skills we use to make model planes all the time. There's no reason not to give it a try. This is not that difficult to do. And the trick is always getting it on a 45 degree angle so it kind of pushes right in. And just before the grout kicks off, you can just wipe this with a dry towel. Get all the grout lines nice and smooth. No, not a lot different than buffing out a plane. Another couple of tips. Never wash these things in a sink or a toilet. Take them outside. That stuff will clog up pipes quicker than anything else. Anyway, little by little, I just, just buff and clean this up. And I won't take the tape off until this is totally dry. But it'll probably be tomorrow. And I can just dress off the edges. You got a nice little project, especially if you don't have a lot of money. When you do these projects on your own, and Karen and I do these all the time, well, it's, it's almost no money at all, in fact. Now that's got to dry before I can do any more polishing and then vacuum. Like I said before, and because I figure this is the best tip I've ever gotten from George. And I have really, really appreciated the fact that a lot of the modeling skills that Harold taught me, Big Jim, George, other people obviously have passed most of this on. I'm just a link in a food chain here. But the thing is, one good tip, and this is the best tip of all. See, I'm cleaning this and throwing it in the garbage. Don't clean this in a sink. Man, if you do that, you better get ready to go replacing some pipes. I did that once at my other house. I didn't know. See, that was the whole thing. I thought I knew, but I didn't know. And I went and rinsed this out. And what happened is, <laughs> the next day, none of the pipes in the house worked. I had put this right down a sewer. So what I do is I take this out to the garden hose now and a little bit that's left clean it out. Good tip and hey I guess that's the fun of all modeling. There's so many things in the world of modeling and I guess it works in reverse if you're a good uh, whatever, a good construction worker like Mike Kajeski or George or whatever. There's things you can apply right to the world of modeling but these tips, hey, and plus of all it's fun. Hey Karen thinks I'm a real craftsman. I got, I got her fooled boy. Well, Karen and I both are real happy the way this little project worked out. So far, so good. We need to get a mirror yet. I need to, I'm going to be doing some marble work in a hall, and I need to make a little marble step out here. Hey, other than that, this was a nice little project. Back down to the old cardinal. All right, needless to say, this has been drying overnight. I want to pull that tape up real carefully, real carefully, one piece at a time, nice and slow. If the red stuff looks like it isn't coming up real conveniently, I'll just use a hairdryer on it. And that little hairdryer trick for removing tape seemed to work well in the past. Let's give it a try. Now, anytime I get the tape. My first thing is make sure it dries 24 hours, although there are alternative ways of doing it. In this shop, 24 hours seems to be just about right. I like to get a little trick on this is get some of the extra tin foil pulled away since we're just doing small masks. 
and try to pull it up nice and slow. Seems to be the best way. All of this tape has been de-stickyized by rubbing it on a flannel shirt, t-shirt or whatever. Anyway, I'm just trying to get it nice. I want to see how that red tape is going to come off. Again, we're still in the early parts of the learning curve here with the red tape. Maybe we can even find some little little tricks or tips or something that'll work. You can see how sticky. When you leave this on, well, yeah, I don't know, you can see this up close. You can see how much glue actually stays on that tape. It's still sticky even after the second and third time around. That old credit card trick breaks at the edges beautiful by the way with the red tape John I gotta thank you again a great tip now, I've been trying not to use the hairdryer just to see if it really is necessary or under some conditions what conditions it's necessary as we experiment more and more with this material I'm sure we're gonna find a lot more tricks but John did document this by the way and we will send it into stunt news I hope they'll publish it of course See if I see it has any tendency not to make a nice edge, and I'll try to hair dry it, but well, it's a little warmer in here than it normally is. Karen's got the heat up, so. I'm getting so used to working out in the cold, especially in Kenny's shop. It's funny, Kenny, Kenny was complaining he had to go buy five gallons of kerosene for the kerosene heater in his shop. Ah, this, wow, hey, five dollars for heat, oh my God. By about an hour into the job over there, Let's go get the kerosene price is no object. <laughs> he really got some religion. He's not used to working outdoors. I guess that's about as nice as it can get. Now again, every shop condition is different, and I before I go ripping up a lot of tape, I like to get a relative feel for just... If you put this tape on without rubbing it up on a flannel shirt, you're almost guaranteed you're going to have some kind of a problem. It's working that fine line between, oh, it's not sticky enough, and here it goes, it rips up the paint. And most of the times when it rips up the paint, the thing that's wrong is you probably don't have enough thinner in the paint, or it dried in too fast of a condition. Well being this dried out in a freezing garage when it was snowing out I don't know what monsters we've created here but I'm I'm trying to walk that fine line and it is the finest of lines when you get that razor edge and you don't pull up any paint I remember years ago when I when Harold was alive asking people at the Nationals how you get the tape from not pulling up paint and they'd laugh at you they just say you know Hey, figure it out yourself, kid. Am I glad we live in a world now where this stuff gets published in stunt news and shared? It's an amazing transformation in the hobby. It's almost like you can't compare the hobby of years ago to the hobby of today. It's so much better today. At least it seems better in my book, anyway. Some of these old secret of old people we had years ago. Hope they pull up their finish with tape. <laughs> hey, anyway, they're probably hoping I pull up my finish with tape. Okay, that looks real good. Now, again, all these little edges, get a little fine tuning here. And we're not going to get much done on this till later. I see this is this is one of the days I have a lot of <coughs> mail over there to do. The customer always comes first here, so. I'm going to finish pulling this tape off and then get back to work on this tonight, I hope.
couple of things because I have to work on mail this afternoon. Rather than just letting this sit here, I want to keep building up coats of clear over the lettering and over the edges. So what I can do, because it's a reasonable day to be painting outside, at least it's not snowing or anything, I want to get a coat of paint, another coat, I've got a couple on already around the edges, all the edges. Not over anything else other than the edges because I want to be able to block sand them down and I don't want to put clear on any of the yellow yet. So I just want to get the areas built up with clear. Now the purpose of that is that you don't wind up with a two gallons of clear on the whole plane. You only need ten coats of clear right on the edges. Over here you only need maybe three, but in here you need ten, fifteen, so you have that smooth edge when you're all done and you can block sand it down. Real important concept is you don't have the same amount of clear on the whole plane. You only have a lot of clear around the edges, around letra sets. We didn't even do any letra sets yet. And I'm going to do the checkerboard work tonight, but I don't have enough time to do it now, so I'll try to avoid that so that this will be buried under as much clear as possible. But I know I can get the lettering. The lettering really has some high edges here, and it needs at least four or five coats of clear before you can knock it down get it nice and flat. And then when you put the clear on a plane, you put the clear on a whole plane at once, you only really need two or three coats. You save yourself a lot of weight by doing it that way. Hey, you can see what a nice day this turned out to be. What I'm going to, I'm only shooting over the lettering. This is the second coat today. I want to get extra on the lettering and on all these edges. That's one of the secrets to keeping your finish down. The weight of the finish is don't put paint where it doesn't have to be. Only put it where it needs to be. You only really need to build up the paint where your paint edges are. We got some back here even. And if I'm going to do it, we take advantage of a nice day. What I'll do is work on the mail. I'll come out here every half an hour or so, maybe once an hour, and put another coat on. It's an exceptional day for the middle of the winter. I can't believe we're getting such a nice day. But Anyway, if you get it, just let me put this down. If you get it, I'll, I'll look through here. You can see it's only on, see if I can get the candling. It, the, the paint is only on the word. You see where it's only on the lettering. And when that dries up, maybe four or five more coats will be able to really block sand the lettering down real nice. Same thing out on the other wing. Could be drying up by the heating vent while I'm doing the mail and come back to this tonight. Now every year I send my pens out to Bob Martens for a good cleaning. It's like rocket science trying to keep these things running. I'm not good at keeping them running either. Anyway, one little tip I've learned over the years anytime you're going to use ink, it should say right on it, not for paper, it should say for film. The word film is the key here. Now all these pens are empty, I'm going to fill them up. The white ones, I have some white ones and some black ones, I identify them with different color tape. But I need what I need to get for the job upcoming for doing the checkerboards is one thin one and one thick one. Now whenever I use a, a pen with black ink, I take a piece of black tape this is just electrician safe, so I can identify which pens have had the black ink in them, which pens have had the white ink. I want to take this as the thickest one. I want to take one of the thin ones and one of the medium ones. This is a fine one here. Okay, the whole idea is I don't want to go back and forth and I want to wind up with some of the pens with black ink, some with white ink, but I don't want to go back and put black and a white, white and a black, and then they all have gray ink in the very end. So this is a good way just to identify the ones I'm, in fact, I'm only going to fill these two up, one thick one and one thin one for now. Now, needless to say, if you were 
a professional draftsman, you'd know how to clean these. I've tried all kind of stuff, soaking them in hot water and Windex and pen cleaner, and really is a nuisance. This is one of the parts of the job. I guess you have to be more of a uh, meticulous person. Look at this, I can't even find the end to this. Again, this is one of the parts of the job. I wish somebody would invent something a little better. I wish I would invent it. Anyway, you want to have a thick pen and a thin pen for doing this job. It takes a while to get the ink to just come out. If you're having trouble with the ink sticking, you can take some talcum powder and a paper towel and just wipe the area. That seems to work pretty well. You want to have one of those. You want to have one that makes thin lines. So you have some thin lines, thick lines, have them identified which is which. Now, as a free bonus, I had just enough ink to get a real thin line pen going here, too. So I have a real thin one. In fact, I'll put some black tape on this. So having three of them, it'll be a little bonus for doing the ink work on this plane. I don't plan on overdoing a lot of the ink work, but it is nice. It's a good practice, too. Tuning up for the new Spitfire. Hmm, assuming we get some ink work on that. We'll have ink work all over the place. So if you look at the thickness of the lines, or the rivet heads, you have three possibilities here. And if you put them right next to each other, you can see the thickness. Now it gives you quite a bit of, uh, well, quite a bit of variation as to what you can do with just having three pens. We got three and we have four left for the white ink. And remember, the key here is that it says for film, not paper. Always take a little this is just ordinary talcum powder. You can kind of rub that in, grind it in. This is just in case you have some greasy fingerprints on the area. In this case, we're going to be making a checkerboard, and you can make the thickness of the checkerboard. Get one of these pens started. I like to outline it with relatively thin lines. You can use a machinist ruler, by the way. I put pieces of eighth inch tape on the bottom so that the ruler sits up off the part. Now when you're going over silk span, of course, it's, it's important that you're very careful not to let the ink bleed underneath. I always try to hold the pen just a little bit on an angle, very little. Now this is to set the width. Now, it's always a good idea to just let it sit for a second. Pick it up. You can get all the vertical bars in one by one. And if you want to make smaller, larger, just change the width of the ruler or cut a template out of sixteenth plywood. Let that completely dry. Once that's dry, I'll get in the horizontal bars. You really just have to give this a second or so to dry between boxes. See, what I want to do is drag the ruler through the wet ink. Once you get one in, now you only need to work on one half of the ruler at a time. Now, of course, if you happen to gush one of these up, and you don't want to clean it, you can just make that box. See, right down here, there's a little imperfection. We'll make that box one of the black boxes, and you can just fill it in. You don't even have to go back and undo it. Now, funny story. This is absolutely true. One day, Bill Rich called me up, and we were conversing and cajoling and everything, and he said, Boy, Wendy, what a pain in the ass it is doing those checkerboards. Took me a whole week or something of that. And I said, well, how'd you do them, Bill? He said, oh, I painted it white, then I cut up all this masking tape, 
back mast it. I said, don't have you ever seen this way of doing it with the open grid and uh, some India ink? And this way, there's no paint edges either. <laughs> I showed him the video. He went berserk. Anyway, now you need to figure out which ones are going to be black, which ones are going to be white. Now, since I have an imperfection here, this would be black, this would be black, this would be black. So I can go in and start with this one. Now, it's, it's handy if you have a wide pen. This is a medium pen here. You can just pretty much let work from left to right, right to left, whatever is easier for you. And like just like a, a kid's game of fill in the numbers, you can make the most exotic, you know, like a Paul Walker paint job with his checkerboards all over the plane, up and down the sides on the wheel pants. Or you can keep it kind of simple like we just have these, basically these little shields as a little trademark for the Brodak Cardinal because these are on the Cardinal plans. Now, obviously you want to be careful. The best thing, of course, is go get Brian Kiefer to do this. Brian just happens to be, you know, he's in the 10,000 checkerboard before I get a, he a, a headache club. I'm in the do one wing panel and you get a headache. Anyway, to, to lay these in, a little bit wider pen, this will lay it in a lot faster. And of course, what this does that's nice too, it adds no weight to the plane. Black paint would add a lit, an edge. You'd have to fill the edge with clear. This you can do the whole thing in a matter of maybe a half an hour, an hour of checkerboard. You can design up some really exotic paint jobs on your own. You don't even, the ink is even cheap. The only thing you need is a halfway decent set of pens. Hey now, obviously from this point on, it's just do a square, let it dry, do a square, let it dry, do a square, let it dry. Real easy. By but now you're blind. It just gives you a little idea. Now, I want this to dry thoroughly. I'm going to get a coat of clear over everything. And then I'm going to put the final outline with ink. But I want to get some clear over it first. And because I'm running out of time tonight, just too many, <laughs> just too busy around here. This is crazy. Anyway, I'll get the rudder done tomorrow and hopefully even get some clear on it and I'm looking forward to getting out to Jimmy Borelli's shop and seeing his new PM. He's got a good one cooking. A couple of tips at the end of the day. I always store the pens with the caps on them. I like to leave them tightly capped. Hopefully tomorrow I'll just give it a couple of little uh, dots and it'll be ready to go. But, but you never can bank on it, that's for sure. It's some idea of what the, the possibilities are. You could make the one, just, just some of the thoughts, you could make the ones on the back go on a diamond angle, make bigger, smaller. Uh, there's a lot of possibilities. You, you don't only have to have black and white checks. You could make that red and black or whatever. It gives you a lot of choices. It's a very nice, easy way to put some, some little uh, trim, decor decorative effects on a plane without a lot of work. But like I said, that's it for tonight, and I'll see you in the morning. Now today, I want to get the rudder to match this, of course, and it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to get any clear on. It's raining today, but I will work on this, and I have a couple little other details I want to take care of, so maybe I'll just have a relaxing little afternoon here. And we're going to be going to Jim Borelli's this afternoon, so I'll see what I can lay out as far as getting the rest of this trim on, but I doubt that I'm going to be able to get any clear on this. It just doesn't look like uh, the gods are smiling on us today. have found that doing any kind of ink work, working in a, a horizontal plane like this as opposed to trying to work sideways, this is almost the only way you can work with these pens. And since they've been sitting overnight, it's always a thrill. I always love to do this. You open a pen up and here you are, you're saying about 17 prayers. 
do a little shaking. If you hear a ball moving, you know you might have some luck. Looks like we're going to have no luck at all, but that's about par for the course. Ah, we're getting some writing out of it now. But a lot of times they will clog up and you got to take the tips out, soak them in ammonia. I've tried all kind of stuff. I've never had a miracle cure, but they do make pen cleaner, Windex, ammonia, hot water. And until you hear that ball clicking, you're not really going to get the pens to write. thing of course is to take I took the the little plywood template put three layers of eighth inch tape so it raises it up off and I can use the template to do the incline I can do it in really the easiest way is to do one segment at a time let it dry and then move the template that's why I leave the little tape on it's really difficult to go around the whole thing at once but if you do one leg at a time one segment And just leave that there till it dries. Now the last piece will be just finishing this up. And again, waiting for it to dry. As soon as you go to pick it up, it smears the ink. So you want to give it a couple of seconds to dry. Any little spots where it's not sticking, you can the ink isn't sticking, just go back over it. It's always easiest to take the real fine pen and, and just feather in the points. It's hard to get the points real nice with a thick pen. And any edge where you see you need the point, now I would have much preferred to get a coat of clear on here first. And I know what's going to happen is when I get clear on here I'm going to have to touch up this edge a little bit, but it certainly isn't the end of the world and that allows me <clears throat> allows me to get on going to the next step on this. have a little bit of time left every day just turns crazy and the other taking some 320 paper or 400 it depends how rough this edge is and I just I have about five coats of clear on here now just around the edges I'm just giving it a very soft circular sanding to try to break the edges and then the next time I get a full session of work on this I'm going to do the ink lining around the lettering but we are going out to Borelli's and I am looking forward to it, but I figured I could get some of this sanding done before I go out there. Always enjoy the social end of the hobby. We go out to see Jim, of course, it's his, his daughter's birthday, so we'll be having a little celebration and get to see his new models. He's usually building at least one and sometimes two or three different models. And what's nice is his wife and my wife have gotten to be real intimate friends, real good friends. So they're always talking on the phone and talking about what a bunch of bums we are for stinking up the house. But if you give that just a little bit of sanding and just scuff it up, even just the least little bit, it'll make doing the ink a lot easier. Now I did get the lines around there without a coat of clear. I know that's going to need some touch up. But because of the rain, I was forced to do it that way. I really didn't have much of a choice. In fact, what I may do, I see these are, these are just a little high. It looks like it could use one more coat of clear before I put the inking on it. I think I'm going to put one more coat of clear. See, this is almost the kind of thing you have to do little by little until you see exactly where you stand. Let me show what I mean up, up close. You can still see the little edges here, a little roughness. So I think what I'll do is, rather than fool around here, 
is get, I need some clear on the checkerboards anyway, get some clear on the checkerboards, on the arrowheads, and on the lettering. One more coat of clear will be a good investment in getting this as nice as we possibly can make it. And I think, I think it stopped raining. I want to for sure test the gun on the bottom. Always a good idea to try the bottom first. Again, we probably could have gotten away with this. But now see if I put a whole nother coat of clear on the whole plane, I'd really be putting a lot of extra weight on it. The only place I need the extra paint is on these little edges. Then when I put the real clear on the plane, two or three nice coats will do it. I won't have a lot of extra material on it. Put a little extra right on a candy apple, in fact, it's not even going to hurt. That amount of weight, it won't even matter. Beautiful colors, by the way. These colors really look nice in real life. I think even John Brodak will be impressed with the colors. The name is Brodak Yellow. Brodak Purple or something. Anyway, the real object here is just to get a coat without getting all that extra weight on the plane. That's yeah, going to be all right. I'll be fine. Even though it stopped raining before, the wind is blowing pretty a decent amount. Anyway, let me always try to get it in the sun if I can. Come on, I'll feed you. Maybe you pick up the spray gun, the wind just picks up. I love the colors in the sun. The colors are really going to be beautiful. Again, I'm only trying to get the parts that have an edge. I hope you can see the sunshine. Once you get this coat on, you can really see it really did pay to do this. It really is going to make for a much nicer job. It's going to make for smoother edging. Kind of a patience thing. You just have to be patient. Declared it'll be sanded, it wouldn't even matter if you didn't get it off. You may want to later on put some fogging on this canopy, the canopy. I usually like to do some fancy stuff with the canopy, but hey, I guess we're gonna find out sooner or later if we like it or not. Now a couple minutes of sitting in the sun here will cook it off and I can get one more coat on it. You can see that the clear is only on a lettering. Lettering and the trim. And we'll be ready to put the clear on the whole model. I want to get ink lines around here. I want to put a couple letra sets on there, but good idea to just let it sit out in the sun here for 10-15 minutes and then I'll put another coat on. This is now imagine if you put the clear on the whole plane unnecessarily. God, you, you add two or three ounces of extra paint for no reason at all. You want a lot of clear where the lettering is, a lot of clear where the edge, and where the rest of it is, where there's no ink and no letter sets, two or three coats of clear is fine. This is a good way to save some weight, especially on a small, what's going to be a, uh, you know, relatively small model.
Okay, I managed to get three coats of clear on this. There's three coats, one right on top of the other, roughly a half hour apart. And it's just about that time to uh, pack up the show and get out to Jim Borelli's for the birthday party. So let's hope we don't hit a lot of traffic. Now we're out at Borelli's and check this out. Check out the sled. Yeah, I'll lock it. We get out here. I got to get a picture of this before it gets stuck. Look at the sled. Handmade from balsa wood by Jim Borelli. And of course, they're getting ready to have baby Lena's, I don't know, 30th birthday party or something here. Anyway, but we're what we're really here for is to see Jimmy's new plane. Lena, baby Lena. Nah. Big Lena's there, there and baby Lena. Love this. Brodak, maybe you should come out with a kit for a, a sled. Hey, I'd buy one. All right. Party time. Hey, yeah, yeah. In case you were wondering, no, this is not a video that's dedicated a thousand percent to model planes. You know what, guys? Ladies and gentlemen, more to life than just model planes. And one of them thing is this sled. I love this sled. Hey, here's the deal, John. We're coming out to Pennsylvania. If you can find one of these in some old farmer's barn for about 15 bucks, I'll take it. We'll put a nice finish on it, too.